Welcome to our virtual Christmas Eve service with Front Royal Presbyterian. It's a little different this year because Misty is out with the flu. So I'm gonna give a Christmas Eve message here and share with you one of Cecilia's songs. And then we invite you, if you'd like, to join us at Christmas in the Barn or at seven o'clock for our in-person service. And then those will both be Facebook Live and we will place them on our website. I apologize that it's not a full service with song and candles. <laughs> my, my friends, we are here to worship the Lord. And sometimes in this time of the year, we need to be reminded to keep it simple. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, on this night, we remember that the veil between heaven and earth is ever so thin. And as we hear angels sing, and as we worship, as we hear your word, we share your good news. Be with us in whatever corner of the world we are. Through your son's name, amen. This is the word of the Lord as it comes to us from the Gospel of John, from the Message Bible. It's John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. The Word was first. The Word, present to God. God, present in the Word. The Word was God, in readiness for God from day one. Everything was created through him. Nothing, not one thing, came into being without him. What came into existence was life, and the life was light to live by. The life light blazed out of the darkness, and the darkness could not put it out. I have just a few short reflections this evening, and each one of them is matched with a poem from one of my favorite Christmas books, Kneeling in Bethlehem by Anne Weems. John is not one gospel that we typically turn to on Christmas Eve, because John doesn't have the story of the nativity doesn't have all of the shepherds and all those good feelings that we have. The innocent Mary and the babe swaddled in cloths. But it has a theological depth and reason to it. Physicists from the very beginning of when they got their knowledge have been trying to explain how everything that we have came into being. They've tried to explain it and all they can come up with, with all of their knowledge, is that there was a big bang. And they, they try to describe it and go beyond it and beyond it, but when they begin to explain it too much and they break it down, they too admit that the theory falls short at some point. Tonight, we don't have all of the explanations. We don't have all of the answers. And when we look at the mysteries of a world around us and of our faith, we do testify that on Christmas, it comes to an answer. And that answer comes as a tiny baby. A tiny baby, God made flesh. It's called light or word or logos. And John is very clear to say that he was there in the very, very beginning. That there was never a time without Christ. It's the Trinity that we confess it's the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in that very beginning, whether it's a big bang or it's God who always is, was, and always will be. And light, we've tried to understand light. And as we try to grasp the meaning of light, we fail to understand it. 
Because at one minute, it's moving faster than we can begin to imagine. At one point, it's a wave and then it's a particle, depending on how you look at it. Light, we cannot explain. Its truth eludes us. And so does the Word. The Word was with God in the beginning. The Word was God. The Word was light. And we can try to explain all of the things in our world. But maybe tonight, the most important thing is, we kneel at the manger. I'm gonna read, it's called Toward the Light. Too often our answer to the darkness is not running towards Bethlehem, but running away. We ought to know by now that we can't see where we're going in the dark. Running away is rampant. Separation is stylish. Separation from mates, from friends, from self. Run and tranquilize it. Don't talk about it, avoid. Run away and join the army of those who have already run away. When are we going to learn that Christmas peace comes only when we turn and face the darkness? Only then will we be able to see the true light of the world. Thank you, Jacob, for reading scripture for us today from the ski slopes. The birth of Jesus. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world would be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Curnius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth to Galilee to Judah, to the city of David, called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, they, their time came from her to, or the time came for her to deliver a child. And she gave birth to her first her son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for him at the end. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in the manger. And suddenly there was an angel, a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God, highest in the heaven, and on earth peace among those for whom he faithful. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went, in, so they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been done, what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, and as it had been told to them. Anne Weems writes this poem, and it's titled Unexpected. Even now, we simply do not expect to find a deity in a stable. Somehow the setting is all round, the swaddling cloths too plain, the manger too common for the likes of a savior, the straw inelegant, the animals reeking and noisy, the whole scene too ordinary for our taste. And the cast of characters is no better, with the possible exception of the kings, who among them is fit for this night. The shepherds, certainly too crude. The carpenter, too rough. The girl, too young, and the baby. Whoever expected a baby, whoever expected the advent of God in a helpless child, had the Messiah arrived in the blazing light of the glory of a legion of angels wielding golden swords, the whole world would have been conquered for Christ right then and there. 
And we in the church, to say nothing of the world, wouldn't have so much trouble today. Even now, we simply do not expect to face the word armed with love. As we continue to speak about understanding the world around us, we recognize that Christmas is grace. And we don't understand grace. It's beyond our comprehension. So we tame it. Each year, we place the manger before us and we neatly tidy it up. Because our simple minds cannot fathom the reality that God would take on flesh from heaven and dwell among us. In fact, it really never could have happened but for God. I'm reminded at our Christmas in the barn and my neighbor was always saying, I'm gonna clean it up. It's gonna be nice and tidy. I'll make sure the stalls are cleaned out. And my response is absolutely not. The first stable wasn't clean. I don't want this to be either. It's about recognizing what God did. But we're very careful to put a roof on the nativity and furnish it nicely, make it nice and clean and comfortable. We turn it into a feeling instead of an event. The word became flesh, incarnation. There's nothing tame about it. It is not touching. It is not beautiful. It is uninhabitable grace and terror, beautiful and gut-wrenching all at the same time. On this night, we recognize that not just Mary, but all of creation had labor pains to bring this forth today. That all of things around us are only here because God saw it fit to give us grace. It's unexpected. And we tame it. Maybe the only proper response is to literally cover our eyes and shudder before it and affirm this is God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, who for us and for our salvation, words from the Nicene Creed, that came down from heaven on this night. All glory be to God the Father.
Many people say to me on Christmas Eve, why must we celebrate the death of Christ through the Lord's Supper on the same day that we celebrate his birth? It doesn't seem quite right. Why can't we just spend time at the manger, celebrate the shepherds? Why must we fast forward to that agonizing death on this night of all nights? No, we don't want to think about death. But we would be remiss if we looked to the manger and didn't also see a cross. We would be wrong if we celebrate today not also knowing the gift of Easter. He took on flesh and blood to die. Tonight we celebrate but we also celebrate as we share communion. That gift of bread and cup, it is beyond our understanding. It can seem jarring to put the birth and the death, death together. It doesn't seem quite right that they belong together. We want to make his rude entrance into the world just a little more joyful. We want to replace the strips of cloth with tinsel. We want to replace the cold of that night with a cup of hot chocolate by a window. As we celebrate, we decorate our houses and our churches rather than sitting in a barn. We would replace this night if we could with all those things that make it comfortable. We'd replace the manger with a stylish trendy bed from Target Fluffy blankets would be used instead of swaddling cloths. And we'd get rid of the sheep because they would probably just smell. So we certainly would prefer to celebrate the Lord's Supper without thinking too much about it. It's a joy and it's a gift. But when we celebrate, we also celebrate the coming of Easter and the empty tomb. Tonight, there's a tiny child in the manger. But if you look closely, there is also a cross. And each time we gather here, we proclaim that the Lord will come again in glory. That's what we celebrate this Christmas. Not just the fact that there's a newborn child that broke through heaven for each one of us. But we profess that faith that says, yes, he will come again to redeem all that is, was, and ever will be. My friends, the gift of Christmas is also the promise of Easter. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.